Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and today we're gonna build the smallest desktop PC I've ever built on the channel. Now, in life, I've built smaller computers like this. It's a Raspberry Pi. Most of you are probably familiar with these. It's a single board computer housed in a super compact and actively cooled acrylic case. And despite its form factor, it's a fully functional desktop computer. But while a beast for its size and price, there are some things you can't accomplish on this due to its limited computing power. So today we're going to build what's been described as the Raspberry Pi on steroids using this. This is the i7 1165G7 powered mainboard from my framework laptop. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the framework laptop, it's a completely modular and upgradable ultra portable laptop. I've done both an initial and long-term review of the laptop. You can find links to those videos in the description below. I've also done other DIY projects with the laptop, including prototyping different expansion cards and a scratch build of my own desktop enclosure for the main board dubbed Project CJ64, as it's inspired by my first PC, the Commodore 64. Links to those videos are also below. And within a few days of posting this video, I'll be posting an update on the project to my Patreon channel for my patrons, as they are the only sponsors of this channel. But today, I'm not doing a scratch build. Instead, I'm printing out the desktop enclosure Framework has designed and uploaded to their GitHub repository. Framework did this in conjunction with releasing all three versions of their main board for sale on the marketplace. So not only now does this desktop enclosure provide a place to house your old laptop main board when the time comes to upgrade, if you so desire, you can purchase a main board from Framework and build your own almost invisible desktop computer. So that's what we're gonna explore today. I'm gonna show you how to get all the correct models and 3D print the case, how to assemble it with the main board and other optional components. And because a lot of people were concerned with Project CJ64, we'll look at the thermal performance of the main board in a plastic case, as opposed to the laptop chassis. And finally, we'll take a look at the overall cost of the project, both in repurposing and buying a main board. I'll also look at some other options for getting the case printed if you don't have your own 3D printer. So the first step is download the models. The case can be found on the framework GitHub repository under main board. I added a link in the description and in the mechanical folder, you can find the printable case. But before we jump into those parts, Framework also released a very basic VESA montable tray for the main board, which can be found in the open SCAD folder. There are two 3D models of the frame, one with and one without a mount for the Wi-Fi card and antenna. And there's an open SCAD file, so you can use the frame as a starting point for your own project. Now, if we go back to the printable case folder, there are multiple files. The case is divided into five parts, plus some connect pins, and there are two versions of the case. The cut version that has the expansion bays cut out or open to allow for oversized expansion cards, and the full version that encloses the standard expansion cards. I'll be building the full version today, so the files I'll need are the bottom cover left and right full, the top cover left and right full, the top cover main, and connect pin. There are also step files included so you can bring the entire case into your favorite CAD software and make any changes you want. The next step is to slice the model and output the G-code for your 3D printer. Of course, if you have a 3D printer, then you're probably well versed in this process. My printer is an Anycubic Mega S with a 200 millimeter square build plate. So for the first print, I was able to fit both the right and left top covers and all 10 of the connect pins we'll be needing. And I sliced the model with Cura with a layer height of 0.15 millimeters. Now I had planned to print the model with ABS because it's strong and the most heat resistant filament. It would have been my first time printing with ABS, but unfortunately I just couldn't get it to work on my printer despite trying hairspray, glue sticks, and an ABS slurry. The first layer, and this is just the small calibration cube I was trying to print, 
just warped and delayered. I'm pretty sure it's because the lowest speed of the layer cooling fan is just still too high for those first layers. Anyway, the next best option was PETG. It's stronger and slightly more heat resistant than PLA and maybe more importantly, less prone to shrinkage than both PLA and definitely ABS. So I was able to print everything in four sessions with my settings and printer. It took a total of 38 hours of print time. Another added benefit of PETG is that it prints very cleanly with no stringing and with very tight tolerances. So there was very little finishing work, which is good because PETG is tough and not as easy to sand as ABS or even PLA. Assembly is very simple. The bottom left and right side slide together. Now, I did have a small print defect in a very inconvenient area. So I did need to do a bit of filing to get things to slide together smoothly. This might've been a bit of a design problem with the bottom bevel on a sharp curve. A support on this one area could have prevented this, but easy fix. So now I can add the 10 connect pins into the holes here and the top cover pieces slide onto those pins. And now let's build a computer. And besides the main board with the SSD and RAM installed, I've also removed the Wi-Fi card and fastener and the sound card. And I'm using the screws from my laptop, but there are exact specifications for the types of screws needed at the bottom of the page we downloaded the STL files from. Additionally, you can screw the screws directly into the printed part to cut the threads. And if you're careful, it shouldn't be a problem. Just go slow and steady so you don't strip the plastic out. Not surprisingly, the main board lined up perfectly in the case. Once secured, I installed the soundboard, which is optional, of course, and the Wi-Fi card. I also purchased a set of Wi-Fi antenna to mount in the provided mounting location and use the retention cover to secure the antenna connections in place. Now that it's assembled, I will say it is a high quality 3D printed case. Tolerances are very good. Everything lined up and fit. The expansion card slid in and fit perfectly. With the full model, you do need to remove the side cover to swap the cards. Having the connector pins as a separate part and not part of the cover or case is smart. If one or more break, you don't have to print an entire part out, just a replacement pin. However, I installed them all in the bottom case and after pulling it apart the first time, they just, well, stay where they wanna stay. Not a big deal. Now, the needs improvement first, while you can buy all the components for this, main board, sound board, even the SSD memory and Wi-Fi card from the framework marketplace, and the antenna are easily obtainable from various retailers. The one piece that is pretty instrumental in the build that can only be cannibalized from the framework laptop is the Wi-Fi retention bracket, whose primary job is to keep those little antenna wires secured to the card. Without it, those things are bound to pop off. I'm not sure if it's possible, but if it is, Framework should add that bracket to the marketplace and possibly a set of the required screws for the case just to make things easier for the masses. Also, there are no feet included for the case, so it just lies flat on the desk. However, the cooling fan draws fresh air in from the bottom and exhausts it out the back. So without feet, the computer is suffocated. So I'm just gonna add the feet from my CJ64 case. They're just mounted with some double-sided tape, but this can be easily modified to add some feet that just pop into some holes on the bottom. In any case, you're definitely going to need to prop the case up if you're gonna use it. As far as overall design, it's pretty good, but there are these cutouts on the bottom of the case, which do line up with the battery connector and the control surface or touchpad cable connector, which is good, I, I guess, for future expansion, but it does make especially the middle cover a little awkward fitting and not as solidly fitting as I'd like it to be, but that's really minor, especially if you're not handling the case often. The only other improvement would be the inclusion of VESA mounting holes on the bottom of the case, so it can be VESA mounted to a standard or directly to the back of a monitor. I could have done that before I printed the case, but I'll just fix it with mechanical means. But now that it's all assembled, let's complete the setup. So first, to continue with the design, the power button actually works and turns the system on, which is very nice, but let's go over the setup. The installed expansion cards are two Type-C, an HDMI port, 
and a type A card. I'm powering the system with a 100 watt type C power supply. We're connected to a simple LG 1080p monitor for testing and I'm using a basic Logitech wireless mouse and keyboard combo. I'm also running a dual boot Windows 11 Linux operating system, but for thermal testing, I'm booted into Windows because the Windows version of the A to 64 stress test is what I used for thermal testing the i7 1165 G7 mainboard in the laptop chassis. After 30 minutes of heat saturation, temperatures peaked at 92 degrees Celsius CPU package temp with an average temp of about 86.7 degrees Celsius. The test has been running for almost 30 minutes now and in the plastic case, I'm seeing CPU temps Currently at 63 degrees Celsius, they peaked at 84 with an average temp of 70.7 degrees. So for those concerned that the main board may get too hot in an insulated plastic case, not so much. It's actually a lot better because with all the ventilation, it's essentially an open air chassis. However, the exhaust air is peaking at over 50 degrees Celsius, so avoiding PLA is a good choice as it starts to get soft at about 50 degrees Celsius, while PETG has a higher glass transition temp of about 85 and ABS is closer to 105. Now, while with the openness, it's also much louder as you may hear if I cut out any audio post-processing. So let me go ahead and stop that test and we'll look at the cost of the project. First, if you're repurposing your old main board after upgrading, which I don't usually mention anything about leaks on the channel, but there have been some leaks of a 12th gen Intel framework benchmarks. So it's possible we will be getting upgrade options soon, but the out of pocket cost for this can vary. The spool of PETG cost me $18 and I only used about 250 grams or a quarter of the spool, so that's $4.50. If you want to include a new audio card, that's $14. A Wi-Fi card is $18. The antenna I used are only $9. So far, that's $45. If you're bringing the SSD in memory from the old main board with the move, then that's it. If not, then there is of course the added cost of those components. Now, if you don't have a 3D printer, I got a quote from CraftCloud to have all the parts printed. This will vary depending on your location, but for me, it would cost $51 to have the case printed in ABS and delivered in 10 to 14 days. You pay more, you get it faster. Now, I've never used CraftCloud before. It was recommended to me, so I went ahead and bought the case. When it arrives, I'll make a community post about it. So if you're not already, be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss that. Now, if you want to build it from scratch and buy all the parts, including the main board from Framework, going with the i5 board, 16 gigs of memory and a 256 gig SSD, you're looking at just over $580. Is this a good value for a mini desktop PC? Well, that really depends on who you are. It's very comparable and even cheaper than a similarly spec pre-built mini PC you can buy, but you can buy or even build a mini PC like this Ryzen 3200G based PC for cheaper and get very similar levels of performance in basic computing tasks. Ultimately, just from a price to performance viewpoint, no, the scratch build option isn't the best you can do, but for anyone considering that option, my guess it's more about supporting framework than getting the best mini PC for the money. Plus, if you're a builder or just a tinkerer, it's, well, fun. Now, as far as repurposing option, it's absolutely phenomenal. You can upgrade your laptop to hopefully soon a much better and way more efficient Intel 12th gen mainboard, and then very inexpensively have a whole other fully functional desktop computer with little to no design experience needed. And not only has Framework provided a case, they also provided 2D plans for the motherboard, as well as pinouts for all the motherboard connectors and made the embedded controller firmware open source. They've provided so many tools which allow anyone with a bit of knowledge to create so many really cool things. So what are your plans for your old framework parts when the time comes to upgrade? Or are you gonna buy just a main board for a project? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to click that like and be sure to get subscribed for future content. And 
I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you.